The new mission statement is so that Wikimedia would become the essential infrastructure uh, to support the open source, the open knowledge movement, where we voluntarily decide to not only support our project, but to support the general ecosystem. I'm Jane McConnell, and welcome to Imaginize World, where we talk with forward thinkers, pioneering organizations, and writers of speculative fiction. We explore emerging trends, technologies, world-changing ideas, and above all, share our journeys, challenges, and successes. Greetings. We all know the Wikipedia, and today we're going to learn more about what's going on behind the curtains, things we might not be aware of. My guest is Florence De Vouar, who's been with the Wikimedia Foundation for 22 years, and the Wikipedia itself is only 23 years old. Florence was the second chairperson of the Wikimedia Foundation following Jimmy Wales. The Wikimedia Foundation is like a mothership because there are 200 or so entities in the whole ecosystem, many country entities and other specific entities. However, one continent is absent from the Wikipedia, and that is Africa. I should put that in the past tense because Florence noticed this about 10 years ago and started some major initiatives in Africa to bring it to the Wikipedia and the Wikipedia to Africans. She's made lots of progress and she'll talk about that with us. Reliability has always been a concern for people about the Wikipedia. People say, how can the information be up to date? It's produced by normal people like us. How could it be reliable? And in fact, today, it has become one of the top five websites used in the world. How did they achieve this? How did they make it a source of information today that's verified and referenced? Florence will tell us the details. I asked about the future. What lies ahead? What are the challenges for the next 10 or 15 years? The first one, unsurprisingly, is finances. It takes money to create a system that's free for everyone. Second challenge is how to share information in a media that fits today's world, where people prefer video, audio, chunked, short pieces. AI is another challenge. The Wikipedia people have been using it for a long time, but the current spread of generative AI means that people are beginning to use chat GPT to get information. And there's a concern this might decrease the use of the Wikipedia by people who don't understand what chat GPT is really doing. Freedom in the world is a very serious concern. What's happening today in Russia with the Wikipedia will surprise you. And Florence is going to explain the details of it to us. A final challenge, which is critical for all of us, is climate change and the fact that there is not enough data out in the open about climate change. Florence has a plea to all of us at the end of our conversation how we can help with that. The Wikimedia Foundation now has a new mission statement, and that is that they want to make the Wikimedia the essential infrastructure to support the open knowledge movement by 2030. Let's find out from Florence how this is going to happen. Hello, Florence. It's Hello, re really nice to see you here. We've known each other for, I don't know, maybe 10 years. I remember when you came and talked to my group in Paris twice, in fact. We had a meeting at uh, Alstom headquarters and we had a meeting at UNESCO. And both times, my groups of uh, digital practitioners were just blown away by what you had to say. It's true about the Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Foundation. There's so much about the Wikimedia Foundation that people don't know, and I've learned thanks to you. Could you, I'd like to start uh, with you giving us an overview of what I would call the Wikimedia world. So what most people have understood so far is that Wikipedia, which is the biggest project of, of this world, is edited, maintained by volunteers. So that much is in people's mind. So volunteers, just to give a figure, we probably are, it's, we're not so numerous. We're probably a hundred thousand worldwide. Oh, so that's, that's quite a few people. That's quite, that's quite a few people. But when you compare to the number of readers, that's actually not much. We're still roughly in the top five of website most visited in the world. So 100,000 is not so much in comparison to the number of readers we have, but it's quite a few people. 
So roughly we have Wikipedia, which is the most well-known project, and we have others slightly less known, but Wikidata might ring a bell to some people. It's structured data and uh, Wikimedia Commons for um, media object. So altogether, these about 50, 15 projects so far represent what we call the Wikimedia projects. And then we gave a second name, which is the Wikimedia ecosystem. That's a mix of the project, all the volunteers, and also a collection of organizations which were created over time to support the movement. And that's the thing that most people don't know, don't realize, is that we have organizations, in spite of having many as volunteers, they do not come out of the blue. They do not coordinate magically. We have organizations supporting that. And the first organization were created two years after the creation of Wikipedia. So Wikipedia just turned 30, uh, 23 years old. The 15th of January was its anniversary. Well, happy and birthday. <laughs> so happy birthday. We did that last week. We did quite a few celebrations for that. And I've been in the project for 22 years. So I really joined the project a very long time ago. And at that time, it is true. It was entirely volunteer, entirely online. And just to say quickly, Florence, that you were the chairperson of the Wikimedia yes. Foundation. You followed Jimmy Wales when he exactly. stepped aside. You were there. Yes, exactly. So I, I was coming to that. During two years, we were just online, nothing great, nothing. We were just doing our work. Then we created the sort of a mothership, which is the Wikimedia Foundation based in the United States with the first president being Jimmy Ways, the founder of Wikipedia. That was back 20 years ago. And we had the first board election. I was elected as a representative of the community. And uh, hooray for women. The two elected people were two women. So gender gap, mm -hmm. not so much for us. Not at the organization level. We are here. So I was elected. And then uh, for a, I was for two years a vice chair. And then I, went, I became chair after Jimmy Ways on that one. And at the same time, we also created a few new chapters. And there was one in Wikimedia in France called Wikimedia France. And I was one of the founder of Wikimedia France, which is still around, right? And uh, little by little, we added some more. So usually it's based by country. So you might have Wikimedia Germany, uh, Dutchland, Wikimedia Netherlands, and so on. Wikimedia Switzerland. We have some of them are quite evolved with staff and budget. And uh, some of them have no staff and a tinier budget. And some of them don't even have a legal structure. It's more a group of individuals coordinating, doing things in their place. So just to give you a figure, we currently have one big foundation, Wikimedia Foundation. So that's the mothership. And we have 38 chapters, so rather big entities, and over 140 uh, smaller entities. Mm -hmm. So that's worldwide. Chances, if you're in a country, you will have one of these entities in your country. So roughly 200 structures exist and are also part of the ecosystem. That's, uh, I think, something that most people don't realize. No, I think don't, most people don't know that. They just think, you know, collaboration just happened. But yeah, it happened. But we're also connected to the real world. We have servers, we need to pay the servers. We have brand that we need to protect, of course, like the Wikipedia name or the Wikipedia logo needs to be protected. We have also a legal, uh, we are a legal entity. So we need to be able to receive requests from government or for individual when they are complaining. We need to answer um, journalists. And usually journalists likes to have a human real person in front of them with a real name. They don't like so much a username, which is weird. And uh, we have partners like museum, like university, and they also want, they prefer to have entities in front of them. So that's why we developed this entire ecosystem to be able to connect ourselves to the other, the rest of the world, so to speak. And that's fantastic. Is uh, the Wikipedian in residence part of that? So Wikipedia in residence is something we created over time. Most people are volunteers in that whole frame. And then we have some people, staff of, uh, of the entities, of some of the bigger entities. 
And then over time, we got some increasing number of relationship with, in particular, museum, archives, libraries, university, non-governmental agencies. And those wanted to have a special relationship to some very expert Wikipedia so that they could build partnership, exchange data, understand licenses. What could we do together? And to do that, they usually... Uh, recruit, identify people we call Wikipedian in residence. Those are people who are going to be sort of a go-between between between the Wikipedia community and this partner. And they will know both worlds and they will try to, you know, create some bonding there. So those people, we call them the Wikipedian in residence because they are in residence in another entity. I am a Wikipedian in residence part-time. It's not a full-time job. And I'm a Wikipedia in residence at WIPO. That's the World Intellectual Property Organization. So that's a UN agency. And I have been uh, working with them for the past two years. And I'm entering my third year with them. Um, Yeah, to try to get some stuff done together. This is a lot that the Wikipedia or the Wikimedia organization will come to face when it comes to things like copyright and using material. And who owns the material? I mean, a lot of people, there's a lot of criticism of the Wikipedia. There used to be more criticism because of the quality, the so-called bad quality of the content. I know I faced that myself with the editor of my book. I think I told you the other day when we were talking, and she asked me to take a quote out that I had had in my book about defining something from the Wikipedia. And she said, "It's, it's notorious for bad information. And I disagreed strongly, and I did not take it out. And I can look it up and I can give you the page number. But I mean, no, the point is I told her I'll change it. If you can find anything anywhere on the internet that gives me this information in a comprehensive, easy to understand summary. And of course she couldn't. Uh, But I was struck by the fact that her reaction was so, she's in the publishing world and her reaction was real vehement. It was uh, quite strong. It's getting better. Thank God it's getting better. Good, good. But, um, well, the first few years were fine because nobody knew us. So we were in a quiet space. And then little by little, the media started getting attention on us. And of course, our rules at that point were not, you know, super strict. It was quite lenient. And uh, we got a lot of criticism, uh, in particular in France. France mm, was one in of France. the biggest, Yeah, France was one of the most, most critical country amongst all. Um, yeah, I think it's because we have a sort of a special relationship with Encyclopedia, with our past story. Uh, so there's this sort of a requirement that we need to be perfect. We need to be associated with uh, the academic world. Uh, we need to do something scientifically. And we were not all that, of course. There was no review system. Well, we had personal review system, but not an obligation of the identification of the person or of the expert. So we had a different system and they didn't get it. So we were criticized a lot in the first few years. And of course, we had a bunch of scandals, which also, you know, made us appear as problematic. Uh, I remember in particular case, because I was uh, the chairwoman at that time. So I I felt the whole story was a journalist called Sagan Taller in the U.S., And that person had information. Nobody knew that person. So he had a biography, but nobody really looked at it. And he had an information which was vastly incorrect. He found out after two years. And he thought, that's a great opportunity to raise the topic publicly. And God, he did. So there was a lot of negative buzz around this. So that was negative at the moment. But in the end, it was great because it allowed us to grow we thought about our roles, we thought about our processes, and we're an ever-learning organization. So we thought about how can we improve that so that we are even more correct, more uh, do more fact-checking, more review, and we improved over time. And so all the negative, little by little, disappeared. In France, I leave that full-time in particular from, uh, well, the publisher, true, because mm-hmm. we were hurting them first first uh, place, yes. and a lot from the teachers. The mm. teachers were very, very critical, of course. And as for the politicians, they considered we were a cult. 
I was told that many, many times. You're a cult anyway. Like we had dreadlocks or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> it was a bit strange. So how could we fight that? Because we reacted. Well, first, more work, more effort, more, you know, and more policies to get that well order, uh, improve the system. And we also did some external facing things. So I can mention a few ones. Yes, please. For example, Wikimedia France, we always have a president. That president is always in Paris because in Paris, then he can meet the big people. He can be a face. He can be a human being, not a, a random list of weird individuals somewhere. He can mm. be a real person. And usually we don't take the 15 years old people. One of our presidents, for example, was somebody working uh, in a museum as a curator of something super new expertise level. He was very well dressed, a suit and a tie and everything. He looked great. So we could go and talk to the officials and ah, they are not a weird band with uh, whatever. Uh, that was one. Uh, we did a lot of teaching, a lot of training conferences. I did that as a lot as well. Uh, training teachers to explain them how the system is working. So, for ah. example, Media France is certified by the government, by the education, uh, national education system. Certified train- as, a, as what? As an educational? Partner. It's recognized as a, as a, a partner of, a, of a, the French education system to wow. explain how it works. And that helped greatly. When people understand better, they see all the limits, they see the rules, and they, you know, things started changing. And there were comparison with the other encyclopedia, and you know about what happened with all the bad facts that currently the fake news on the internet, they realize that ah, Wikipedia managed pretty well in comparison to all that bad bad information that stands on the internet. So now we have a rather, I would say, good reputation rather good in spite of being always some critical people, of course. It, it still happened and will always happen, but it's better. And one of the, uh, of the things we did very much to make ourselves uh, more respectable, I would say, was precisely partnership with museums, with archives, with libraries, with the university, with uh, uh, UN agencies and so far. Because once we start working with them, They understand how we work. They recognize the quality of what we do. They are happy to partner with us. And then when outside people see that we actually work with them, they think, ah, they're probably not so weirdos if the museum blah, blah, except to work with them. So it gives us some stability. And um, the people we work with are actually typically like us. Many of our participants are actually librarians. They are actually teachers. They are people working in the, in the open, in the, in the knowledge movement already. So it feels like family. So we are connected now to our family, so to speak. Well, that's uh, <laughs> interesting. That, that sounds like the initiatives that were taken were very effective. Did that happen in other countries as well? Yeah, though in some countries it's much more complicated. Um, for example, if you ask, most people in the street in France, if they know Wikipedia, they will say, yeah, they use it. If I ask the same thing, say, in Benin, uh-huh, most people, they don't know. Yeah. And it's more complicated to part with the museum because they already have so many challenges from a financial and organization perspective. So that most of the time, even if they wanted to partner with us, they could not. They do not have the human power to do that. It depends on the countries. Depends on the countries. Florence, you mentioned an African country. Uh, That interests me very much because when you and I talked for my audio podcast back a couple of years ago, uh, you talked a lot about what you had done in the wiki in Africa. Yeah. And uh, that's an absolutely fascinating initiative that you started. And I think it's still going on from what I can tell on the internet. Um, And when you consider what the continent well, Africa, of course, many different countries, the different levels of technology, of awareness, and, and so on and so on. Um, but I gather that it's made quite a difference in the places where you've been active, especially in schools with children. Can you talk a little bit about what you've done there? Yeah, I can. So I've been part of the movement 20 years. That's a generation. Uh, of course, I haven't been doing the 
the same thing during these 20 years. I have changed jobs, so to speak. So the first, the first 10 years, I mostly dedicated myself to the movement at large and to Wikimedia France and to Wikimedia Foundation. And back in 2013, I decided to change. I wanted to do something different and to focus my attention on something that had been bugging me for a very long time. Uh, Wikipedia was mostly European and North American, period. Ah, right. Most participants were American and European. And at that time, well, Wikimedia France was already well established, already had staff member and blah, blah. And when I was looking at Africa, it was not that there was nothing, but next to nothing. We had a chapter in South Africa with something like five members at most. We had a few things in north of, of Africa, such as Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. There was stuff going on. But the rest of the continent, basically nothing. People didn't know about Wikipedia. There were no participants, so to speak. Uh, when there were African participants, there were usually students in France or in the U.S., oh. Yes. They were not locally. So most of the content about Africa was actually written by people from Europe and North America. So it was all wrong. It was all wrong. A typical example was when you were looking at the pictures, most of the pictures were pictures taken by tourists mm -hmm. who went on safari, for the safari. So they brought back some pictures of, uh, you know, lions and sunset and such. So I thought, nah, it cannot go on this way. Um, we said we wanted to uh, bring the entire knowledge to the entire uh, humanity, but entire knowledge, we are missing a lot here, mm. missing a lot. And most of the content about Africa was not yet even on the internet. So I decided to make that change. And I've been focusing on that for the past 10 years now. So I, I launched many programs, uh, some with the support of Wikimedia Foundation, uh, some with the support of various organizations. I could in particular mention the Goethe Institute mm -hmm. and Fondation Orange, with whom I've been working for the past 10 years, but some other organizations as well. But those are my, my number ones, I would say. And um, I found some partners to work with, and we started uh, a group, and we created later an association called Wiki in Africa, which mm -hmm. is located in Cape Town. I'm located in Marseille, so it's really distance work for me. Right. And uh, we have been working in giving visibility of Wikipedia in Africa. So as to start recruiting people, we have mostly be given uh, trying to identify potential participants there, training them, coaching them, mentoring them. We're still doing that 10 years later. And uh, we make it so to support them when they were creating their own local groups. So we have at the same time some project working on the entire continent. There's a big photo contest, Wiki Loves Africa. Still I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's 10th year this year. It will start next, next month. And uh, we're doing the 10th edition. So it's, you have uh, a great website for that. We'll put yeah, a link to it. Yeah, thank you. It's probably the biggest uh, photo contest in Africa. I'm fairly sure of that. And uh, we have an initiative related to the gender gap because we wanted to push the African women to do more and, you know, get up to speed. Uh, and a lot of projects in the education sector. I'm still working on that uh, with primary or secondary school, in particular in rural areas and mm -hmm. areas with bad internet or no internet at all. So there's a whole collection of, of programs we have been setting up. And I'm super happy with the impact. I mean, the... The difference, the, the difference in ecosystem about Africa in our organization now is completely different now than it was 10 years ago. There's still a lot to do, but we now have over 20 user groups in mm. Africa in French speaking, Arabic speaking, and, and English speaking. So not covering the entire continent, but quite a lot. Some of these groups are ah, well developed. Ghana is great. Nigeria is great. Uh, Benin is doing quite a lot. Tunisia, uh, um, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Benin, Cameroon, all those ones, Senegal, it's just things, birthing, lots of uh, energy, lots of, uh, lots of people now coming up and lots of content. So I'm, 
I can see the impact. So it's very, very satisfactory for me. And I continue that job. Yeah. It's interesting because I think uh, the countries in Africa represent very much the future yeah. for the for the planet. And in South America, same thing. And um, in some parts of Asia. And it's very interesting to think that what you're doing is bringing access to information and knowledge to these people and enabling them to share information and knowledge with the rest of the world. Enabling is the biggest part of it because uh, we are missing so much content about them. Uh, and this content is not always published elsewhere. So we, that's a big discovery. And that's tough because in most cases, we don't really have sources that are available to double check things. Right. It's, it's a big issue for all the content coming from this continent is where do we find a source to double check what, that what has been added is actually real and not fake. Mm -hmm. It's like in US and France, we will have too much information. The, the problem will be to find the right source, the, the good one. But then the problem is simply to have a source. It's a, it's a completely different challenge. Um, for us in Europe, the challenge will be often that many of our participants are way older. In Africa, they are way younger. Um, in Europe, we will have people mostly willing to volunteer some time just because they want to be, to, you know, just to do something. Whilst for them, they are hungry for, you know, um, being connected to the rest of the world, having the opportunity for job elsewhere, learning, getting more skills. So it's an entirely different um, ecosystem because not the same reason to participate than most Europeans, mm. for example. So it's a, for me, it's fascinating. I'm still discovering after 10 years. It would be interesting to look at the situation again uh, 10 years from now and see what the change has been in these countries. So they're not directly related to the Wikimedia Foundation, but to the countries in general, and to what extent there are things that can be not attributed directly, but could be indirect effects of this work. That's, that's one of the... I would love to have, well, the means to evaluate the impact, for example, of our education programs. When we do a program in a, in a school with primary kids, uh, like participating to a, a writing drive, which is called Wiki Challenge African Schools. The idea is we bring them some tablets, some blackboards, uh, a contest, some tools. And for the first time, they are still not connected to the internet, but at least they learn digital stuff. They mm -hmm. learn how to type, they learn screens. So it's a, an entire different situation from another school where do, they don't have this material. How will that make a difference for these kids to have been confronted to this material maybe two years, three years, four years than the other kids in the country? Will that make a difference? Will they be better educated, more uh, willing to jump in the big bath? I, I don't know. We, we don't have really measures of that. That would be awesome too. That would be really interesting. Maybe there are some scholars some researchers who will look into that. Yeah, I'm still looking for them. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I'm trying. Yes. The measurement, the measurement is a major, um, something agitating the, the, um, the, the, the grant world, the, the, the people supporting organization, the, the organization that currently support to get out of poverty, to get more education. They, they used to be funding project more like on a leap of their faith, but now they want proof. They want more um, proof that what they deliver in terms of money is actually mm -hmm. making a difference, a significant yes. difference. There's, this requirement is getting much bigger and for reasons. That would be very interesting to, to find. A, it wouldn't take many people, just a few uh, researchers who would be interested in the topic and who could get who could get a grant maybe from their university to study it. Yeah, I, I say that <laughs> you've yeah. obviously tr tried to do it and you've not been able yeah. to. And I hate some people, but uh, yeah. so far, <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. Florence, how how do you see? We're sort of talking. We're sort of moving towards talking about the future, and I'd like to know how you see the future, uh, say ten, fifteen years from now. Uh, from the within the Wikimedia world, which for me is basically the world that we live in, but um, 
I believe you mentioned something about the mission of the Wikimedia Foundation that has changed or is changing. Yeah. Um, so it's it's quite funny to try to project ourselves 15 years in the future when the organization, well, the, the structure is in there for 23 years. It's nearly a doubling our life span. Double your life, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe... Uh, maybe I can give you a little bit of of, of context before mm-hmm. moving to some some of the things that are currently yes. ongoing. So obviously, when we started, we didn't start from an organization. We started as a bunch of people. So we didn't have anything like a mission statement or all these things. We had um, a vision, a- access to knowledge, knowledge for everyone, uh, and we had pillars. We had values that were very important to us, like. Everyone is welcome to to come and help. It's open, like open free uh, free licenses because we wanted to be able to share with everyone. So there mm-hmm. was a, a bunch of pillars there, but we we um, somehow certified confirmed those probably five years later, four or five years later, by having a vision, a mission statement and values and blah, blah, blah. Something a little bit more more official so that everybody would be on the same page. And then maybe after nearly 10 years, we made our first strategy. We did a strategy process, which was not done by a bunch of staff people. It was really done by involving the community. So it was messy. We didn't go very far. Um, This was mostly led by the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation at that time. But she mostly wanted to understand better what united us together. So the outcome of it was just a little bit weak, so to speak, in the sense that it was just only the elements that united us together, but there was nothing really challenging. It was We knew about this thing. So much later, it was back in 2015, which is an important date, 2015, we decided to do our Wikimedia 2030 strategy. So we actually were putting ourselves in the shoes of 15 years later. Right. We started in 2015 for 2030. I think it took us about five years to draft our strategy. Five years? Five years, yeah, I I think so. Because we wanted it to be as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. So we involved everyone. We had... Uh, local events everywhere. We worked in many different languages. There were, there were some people trying to analyze and, you know, analyze and get something out of it, propose it again. So it was a lot of a uh, very long work. And out of this work, there was a very interesting elements that got out. And one was a change of the mission statement. Mm. So we used to be essentially, um, knowledge for everyone and we will support the project to make that happen, the project being Wikipedia and such. And we changed the mission statement. And the the new mission statement is so that Wikimedia would become the essential infrastructure uh, to support the open source, the open knowledge movement. So it's a much larger mission statement where we voluntarily decide to not only support our project, but to support the general ecosystem. So being more involved in advocacy, more supportive of other programs that are not our programs, trying to protect somehow a sort of family-related uh, area. So that's, that was a change. I'm not convinced it's really yet implemented except for a few elements, but we do a lot of advocacy, for example, for uh, the decision over laws and um, and. Uh, all the legal framework that goes around copyright, for example, and all the questions related to privacy, uh, mm. safety of, of people online, and so on. There's a lot of work around this. And we also established uh, 10 directions, 10 programmatic elements. And uh, some of these programmatic elements, we, we managed pretty well. It's ongoing. We worked on the implementation. And some of them, honestly, a little bit of a nightmare. And um, why are it, they a nightmare? We we haven't really succeeded to process to progress very much mm-hmm. on this. So I can safely say that we can say that those goals are still true for the next 15 years because it's not there. So I can pick up a couple of examples, but one 
the one I think would be the most, the easiest for people to understand is the tech part. Mm -hmm. um, people do not consume knowledge now as they used to do in the past. If you look when we were about 20 years old, both yeah. you and I, yes. did you consume knowledge? We go to the library and we pick up the book, book, book right? Book. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. newspaper or uh, uh, journals. That was the way we consumed knowledge, maybe yes. radio and television, right? Yes. And, and, going to, and going to classes where teachers would explain everything. And going to classes, which assumed that there were classes. Assuming there were classes. Correct. Not too far away, not too expensive. True. So <laughs> depending on your, where you were, you had more or less chance, right? And um, one of the big reasons why Jimmy Wales thought of starting the encyclopedia is because in the United States, when you go to university, well, one, it's very expensive. Two, you usually have to travel away from your parents. You, so you need to be able to afford that. And the tuition are very expensive. Mm. And the books, usually you have to buy the books written by the teacher of the class, of the yeah. course. That's how yeah. they make money. And the book is usually $80 yeah. for each class. So, and that's the US. In Africa, <laughs> might be even more challenging. So he started Wikipedia, but at that time, the way we consume knowledge, let's say, 2020-205 was mostly, it became online. So we were still mostly using text because of the bandwidth limitation, mostly using text, but the text was online. So it was less and less in the books, which is why Encyclopedia Britannica disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. To the favor of Wikipedia. But we were on the text, so Wikipedia fitted perfectly the way people consume knowledge. Then we moved to videos. Mm -hmm. That's why YouTube became big thing. Yeah, very big. Uh, yeah, very big, very powerful, and the where the place where most people spend their time. Yeah. So it was difficult for us to move to the video because working together on a video is much more complicated than working on a text, mm -hmm. both in terms of production, of review, of update. It's complicated, and we started getting slow, delayed on the tech part because we were still on our old interface with the text while people were moving to Facebook and all those things, which were more fluid in terms of uh, user experience. What's going on now, Jane? What is going on now? Well, you're thinking about AI, aren't you? Uh, I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking people are still on video, video but now yes. they want Super short video. Oh, like I see TikTok. what you mean. Absolutely. They want TikTok. One they want minute. shorts. Want... Three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Immediate. Three minutes yeah. is even quite long. So they want something super short just here on their desk. Compare that to reading a long Wikipedia article. We still need that. We need the in-depth information. But for many people, they also want this little thing very quickly. And also yeah. the tendency is subtitled, like on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You can watch a video on YouTube and get it subtitled real time uh, and translated now with the AI. I don't yeah. know if you use Heijan or such tool. You can give it the text and uh, an avatar is reading the text for you. Yeah. That's cool, right? Yes. <laughs> like when we do a podcast, you listen instead of having to read. Right. You know, it's still on the reading thing. It has lots of structured data, but it is not using it to um, easily, immediately display, you know, the essence of it for somebody who wants the thing immediately. So we have a whole bunch of things where we are getting late. And then AI. Um, we're not scared of AI. We have been using it within the Wikipedia project for quite a while now. So it's not nothing new for us. But what is becoming in particular in the newer generation, I saw my son do that recently and I was just shocked, was looking for info. He didn't go to Google. He went to ChatGPT to ask an info. And I was, oh my God. <laughs> it's not on ChatGPT, which was the three that he was using, that you're going to find proper uh, checked, updated information no. that's not the right place that's not the way it works but that's what they are doing 
Of course they are. I know. Uh, and so, and so this, this, this is a, a big challenge for us. We, within our list of 10 things we wanted to improve, there was the user experience because it's always needed, making easier to consume or to participate. And there was the innovate in tech. But it, we are late. And um, there are many reasons for that. But if you look at all these companies pouring things, doing great things, they're pouring money. They're pouring tech people to work in that. We don't have that. We don't have as much money or as, as many programmers willing to do that. So that's a challenge for us for the future is how do we stay relevant in the way people are using the, the info? That, that would be for me the biggest challenge we face at the moment that that's the yeah, that's a that's a big one because you on one hand you cannot give up the fact that you have long detailed referenced articles that's very important on the other hand it won't draw people in as quickly as little shorts will so you probably need to find some uh, combination uh, we probably need to find some combination and one of them might be i don't know if you remember when you go on google and you ask info about a person you get a sort of a info box on the right yes yes based stuff yes even that would be great even having a tool that allows to give that quickly yes or make people do queries super quickly and super easily on their cell phone so there's a this f third challenge is definitely one of our big focus i'm sure for the next 15 years it's uh, every we that that's the number one for us. We have a second one, which is somehow linked to what we just said about AI. Uh, it's money, simply money. Sustain mm. financial sustainability for the movement is a big one, yes. and also the way we redistribute and how we make uh, informed decision, which um, fits with our own values, which are subsidiarity and equity. Mm -hmm. To, to give you some, some background info about this. Um, so I said we are about 150 or between 150 to 200 organizations. Right. right. Um, the main organization that makes money, that collects money, is the Wikimedia Foundation. Right. Uh, the budget of the foundation is around $170 million, roughly. Just that. It's, it's at the same time a lot and at the same time really nothing. When really you compare nothing to corporations, major corporations. corporations. Yeah. Tiny yeah. drop yeah. Of, of money. Um, this money comes from, uh, if my memory is correct, oh, around 70 million come from the banners. Mm -hmm. You know, when we have the fundraising banners. Yes, yes. At the end of the fiscal year, yeah. you would see give five dollars to wikipedia to support so yeah, that's i've seen them I've, I've given it several times <laughs> thank you okay. please everyone give it do that. Uh, so that's about 70 and then the second big lot is coming from uh email that are being sent for recurring donors or past donors asking them to donate again it's working pretty well once you people have donated at least once they might give more next time and then the other ones are um, big donors, they're not, they are, there's quite a certain amount of money, but not huge amount of money. And, um, we have developed an API that can be used by enterprise that brings in a bit of money. And, um, an endowment has been set up a few years back and is every year giving a little bit of money. All of that makes 177. Hmm. The trends that are coming is that Lesser and lesser money will come from the fundraising, the, the banners at the top. Mm. So why is that? Yes. Why? For now, it's only dropping because the, the community is complaining about the banners a lot. Say, oh. ah, we shouldn't have these banners all the time. It's embarrassing. Uh -huh. So they complained so much that last year the foundation decided to, okay, we stop earlier than planned. That's just the internal stuff. But if we look further, if more and more people actually use AI to answer the question and give them the details, then they will not come as much on Wikipedia. They will not need to. Wow. Most of the AI are being trained using Wikipedia. So they need our stuff to be there and to be relevant and to be up to date. Yes. When they are, and they have the right to use it to train the model. 
But as soon as the people consume only from the AI, they will not see that info come actually in big part from Wikipedia and they will not come to the website. So it will be less recognized as the, the source of info, so less participants and less visitors, less donors. Have you tried approaching some of the big AI companies and asking for some kind of partnership, non-exclusive partnership and grants that they would give you in exchange for visibly, openly scraping? We approached them. We shamed them in some cases. We said, hey, most of your business is based on that. <laughs> so, and, and of course, they gave some money, but maybe not enough so that we get back to our technical support need. Mm. And maybe it will not be enough to balance this thing. Look at the open AI, which is uh, securing so much attention from, yeah. from my teenagers. Yes. Uh, they do not make any enough money that they will actually give us money. That will not be in their mind. Maybe Google, yes, will, or Apple or whoever. Google typically gives them money. But OpenAI, I don't know if they are donors. And I don't know if they would even think of and how much it might be. So that's, that's a, this final tool thing long term. It's not yet happening, but we see that we know it's a, it's a potential threat for the 15 years. So we have to think even further how to, how to make it clear for people to realize that our content is used a lot by this system, how to, so that they should continue helping our system so that the AI stay good. How could we convince the company doing money thanks to AI to also support us? So there's a whole maybe rethinking about where we should get our financial sustainability from. And uh, do you think it's possible <clears throat> to formulate a, uh, a statement and not a mission statement, but a, a clear statement of this kind of thing, it's important, somehow related to AI, getting information from the Wikipedia, and that it's important to ensure that it's the best information possible. And your donation can help us. Da, 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 da. I don't know if a message like that would be possible. No, I'm pretty sure some of the communication people are thinking about that and already displaying this message. I think it might be understandable from companies at the moment, not so much from the public. Right. It goes too much into detail for them to understand. So, so that's one thing, this financial. But within the financial, there's something interesting as well, is this question of redistribution. Remember I said there was about 200 organizations. Foundation is the bigger one in the U.S. Mostly what they spend money on is the tech side. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the fundraising team. There's the communication team doing a great job. Uh, there are people working on the software to try to improve the user experience and the back office. There's, of course, all the servers and the bandwidth. It's a big, big expense. And there's the legal team, which is not a small team <laughs> either, uh, and the advocacy. So there's a bunch of people working. I don't remember exactly how many people are there uh, because it changed quite a bit. Mm. But rough figures is around 500 to 1,000. Very mm. rough figures, just to give an idea. And uh, the biggest other organization is Germany, mm. which is entirely autonomous, only making money from Germany. Works great. So very powerful, several offices, hundreds of staff member. Okay, compare that to Togo. Togo, no office. I don't think they have any staff member. So locally, what can they do? It's only a bunch of volunteers that cannot do much. Right. So a big question within us um, was raised around how do we actually make sure that areas can develop based uh, not on the money that is available in the country, but based on what the rest of the group can give them. So that, that's one of our biggest challenge, and I may have a few figures based on that. Uh, roughly... Among this 177, the, the amount of money that is redistributed locally is 17 million. Mm. Only 17 million. So it's less than 10%. Yes. And within that amount of money, um, with the understanding that basically Germany and Switzerland are autonomous, 
25% of the 17 is given only to uh, uh, North America. Really? So, see, the U.S. is hugely funded. And so Africa is raising, and I, we are pushing very much, I promise, Jane. We are pushing yeah. very much so Good. that the amount of money dedicated to, to sub-Saharan Africa has increased. And it is going up, in particular for Nigeria, because it's a very large country with lots of different tribes and, and, mm. and different people from different cultures. Yes. Um, but at the same time, we cannot pour a huge amount of money on a group which has hardly any, you know, control in place, you cannot pour a big amount of money on three volunteers. It needs to be a steady growth. And um, how could we decide how we do that? Should it be decided only by a bunch of people in the US or should it be a decision made by a global decision-making community? Those are complicated, but they are all very important for our future. If I look in the next 15 years, I promise we have worked for 15 years there, trying to identify how we can sustain the amount we have or increase it. And how could we be more, could there be more equity in the way we redistribute it? Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's, that's a big, big one. That's a big that's one. That's a very big one. Yeah. Just knowing you, Florence, you're basically, you're feeling positive about the future. I think with all your energy and the people you work with, you feel like you're making progress, even if it's not as fast as you would like. Is is that a fair statement? I think it's a fair statement. Yeah, I'm. Um, I've seen all the up and downs and up and downs. I was still going there, so and there's still a huge lot to do. We haven't touched maybe some of the other. Uh, a little a scary topic, uh, for example, the freedom, the freedom uh, generally yes, in the world, which is a big one. Which uh, is decreasing at which, the moment. Which it seems to be decreasing. First, we have the short-term situation. Yeah. There was an interesting post made recently about Gaza, about mm -hmm. people's lack of access to information in Gaza. How do we deal with such situation? As all together as human being, how do we deal with what is happening? But also in our case, a lack of information for them, uh, internet being cut and so on. Uh, in 2023, we had many problems with the Russian Federation, to say it nicely. So lots of requests for takedown. Uh, they constituted the, they represented the highest number for all countries of complaints and requests for change of content, removal of a page. Russia Russian. requested pages yeah. be taken down yeah. or changed. Yeah. They, the highest number of requests last year came from them pretty normally. They also did a lawsuit. <laughs> did they? Requesting yeah. money if we were not taking down this page, requesting that an office be created in, in Russia so that they would have a Russian person to talk with. Can you imagine what would happen? Uh, no one would accept to do that. So uh, they are creating a sort of um, derivative version uh, of Wikipedia, which would only contain what they wanted to be there. The networks are closing. They Some applications are not available there, so people cannot access the content. Uh, early 2023, I think it was, uh, we have some offline versions of Wikipedia that people can download on their computer. The highest number of downloads was in Russia, of really? course. People were downloading like crazy, thinking this is going to be banned or something. Ah. So that's those are short-term things, but you can see that there are countries who are explicitly creating some sort of a closed internet network in their country. Yes. So how do we reach out to these people? Huh. How do we make it? How do we resist that? Um, in some countries, reading Wikipedia is dangerous. In some countries, editing Wikipedia is very, very dangerous. So it's because it goes against what is legal in the country. So, and uh, at the more um, European, North American uh, level, um, we have to all the time check 
the decisions that are being made of new laws or changing the laws. So lots of advocacy work is being done to make sure that we keep a, a sort of a safe, secure environment for our contributors. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, well, we had some rather good news recently in Europe, but uh, it's, it's always a concern. It's a lot of time must be dedicated to this, making sure that we do, we do resist from some attempt to limit the freedom of people to read and to participate to Wikipedia. And for most people, it's not visible, but it's real. Wow, I didn't know that. That just shows, Florence, what the Wikipedia has become. Yeah, it's a big I mean, The more powerful something is, the more there are people against it, yeah. even when it's a good thing, but it threatens Thanks. some but people. Needs to be strong, need to be yes. resistant, resilient. Um, but for anyone who joins it, that's, there's still a huge lot to do. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. So you're uh, making quite a nice pitch for people to join. Yeah, please. In your work. Job, give the money to help us continue. <laughs> It'd be a good one. Um, you can give in your country. You can give to the Wikimedia Foundation. But if you're in France, give in France. If you're in Germany, give in Germany. Just make sure to keep the thing as uh, non-hierarchical as possible so that we spread the decision-making. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to have as much as possible decision made at the local level than, rather than at global level. Yes. To help. Yeah, it's an important element, I think. That's very important. I mean, that's, that's true for organizations of any sort. The lower the level of decision-making to the point where there is real responsibility for the decision, uh, the better it is. Well, I think we've covered a lot of topics, Florence. Do you have any final thoughts? I have one final uh, thing I would like to mention because I think it's very much in the air and I think every organization needs to question themselves on the topic. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's climate change simply. And if we look 15 years ahead, we <laughs> need to put that in our thinking as well. Yes. Um, all of us, all of us, whether individual or organization. So this is not something uh, we leave aside as well. So I wanted to share some of the, the few things what, that we have been trying to do. Yes. Um, at the global level first, um, well, we tend to be mostly a community that works online. We do not travel much. We still have from time to time some conferences where we meet, which are absolutely necessary so that we coordinate a little bit and get some, you know, family feeling. Yes. Um, but we have tried to reduce that a bit and we have tried to be super careful when it came to travel. So making the right decision train instead of plane whenever it's possible. There are quite a few things. Uh, some organizations such as Wikimedia France is actually measuring, trying to measure the impact of the work done by the association uh, as also a way of, you know, trying to make a difference and making people aware uh, of what they do and could do differently. So that's one. But um this at the at the personal level, I worked at the beginning of the year 2023 on a program that was supported by African Union uh, and the Wikimedia Foundation, and we tried to do something that seems quite simple but is actually missing: is um, to identify a topic of high level, high impact topics that are not yet covered in Wikipedia, but that should be. And the example is we have articles about climate change and impact of climate change in English for every European country or North America country. It's, it's there. So impact of climate change in France does exist and describe the situation and the evolution. So it, it exists as a awesome source of information for anyone who wants to have a picture of the situation at the moment and of the trends and of the impact. And there's so much fake news on the internet related to that topic. So it's yeah. a very good idea to have something straightforward there. And I realized 
in English, we had only two such articles for the entire continent of Africa. Mm. It's simply, it's not that it was small or outdated. It just did not exist. Right. If you look for the impact of climate change in Zimbabwe, you had nothing. So we tried to get some participants to work on this, to identify the topic of high impact and to focus on those ones. And it revealed to be extremely difficult. Oh, wow. Few participants, um, not so many data, in fact. Ah. Uh, there are some cases where lots of info, but it's very hard to identify what is actually relevant and valid, sourced, really double-checked. It's complicated. So it's a mm -hmm. kind of a nightmare to try to find out your way on the topic on the internet. And to actually try to analyze is complicated work. It's easy to write a biography about a, an artist. It's way harder to write an article about the impact of climate change in Botswana. Yes. I mentioned this article because it now exists. We made it. Uh, but it, it's, if I had a recommendation is any organization that has relevant data that they can share and that they can put uh, in the open so that we can reuse them to build up our articles, to build up graphs, to build up images or videos even, uh, think about sharing them. We're not mm. necessarily asking for the reports, though available would be nice, but at least if you could share your data so that we could actually write uh, these uh, high-impact articles, climate change or any topic of interest for the future. But that, that's, that's a collective work. We do mm -hmm. not produce data. We use data produced by others or recorded by others. And if we don't know this data, if it's hidden, if it's not findable, we cannot use that. Mm -hmm. So a please, a plea, <laughs> help us do our job by making yours. If you have data, share your data with others. Yeah, that would be my, my takeaway. Wow, that's a great takeaway for Holmes. We'll make that the the banner. We'll put it across <laughs> our episode. Share your data. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Florence. This has been illuminating. I even learned more today, even after having talked with you recently, sort of talking about doing today. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just so much to be learned about the Wikimedia Foundation world. I would call it because it's uh, yep. It's a it's a big it's a big deal what you guys have done. It's really a big deal. And you all deserve a lot of thanks mm -hmm. from the rest of us. Thank you, Jane. And yeah. thank you for actually allowing us, me in particular, to share these stories, to explain what's going on behind the curtains that people might not be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Well you do a very good job at explaining, Florence. You are a very good uh uh voice. Thank you. Uh, for open information, open knowledge, and the importance it has on the world, the entire world. 